Welcome back. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Sylvester Inspires Belief Cast. Once again, I'm excited to have uh, another amazing guest who has a really unique and beautiful story. Uh, he's written a book um, called Making Good Better. And I'm excited to introduce um, Ben Gorley. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'll get that a little closer to you. Just a little so, closer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ben, um, he graduated from Brigham Young University. He's been a you know an actor, a producer, a director, and writer. You made four feature films. Is That's that right. correct. And uh, again, like I said, he he's written a book called Making Good Better, which we'll get into. And it's from his experience of struggling with his own addiction and realizing that some of the things, or maybe a lot of the things that have been taught in our culture are maybe doing more harm than good around the addiction um, uh, recovery uh, culture that we have here. And I'm excited to hear your, your, your take on that. And uh, you are currently live in St. George and you've started uh, medical school, is that correct? I started in three weeks. <laughs> oh, you haven't even started officially yet. Right, yeah, wow. I'm just getting ready for it. Very cool. Well. Um, I'm excited to have you on. Um, we have a mutual friend, Lindy Davis, who uh, got this all lined up. So we need to thank her. And yes, thank and, you, Lindy. Uh, thank you, Lindy. And then I also want to thank Ver Veracity Networks uh, again for sponsoring this. So Ben, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a busy man, and thanks for uh, stopping by. You're welcome, and thank you. <laughs> this is great. It's great yeah. to be here. This is my first podcast. So. Oh, first podcast for Ben. So uh, we had actually a really good conversation before we got on here, <laughs> which we'll probably get into a little bit more while we're on here. I hope so. So let's uh, let's just give the our listeners a little background on you, like where you grew up, a little bit about your family. I grew up very cookie cutter Mormon in Provo, Utah. I, okay. And when I say cookie cutter, it was sugar cookie. I right. mean, it was very Mormon. We were at church every Sunday and if we weren't we were deathly ill and uh, okay. I went to a school where I didn't see drugs or alcohol all through high school I saw maybe a beer bottle at a at a campfire once right once and I'm not sure it was beer <laughs> <clears throat> so it have been root beer right it could have been <laughs> um, and then I went to Brigham Young University again never saw a drug or any alcohol mm -hmm. the whole time and then I started making movies after going to film school there. Um, and I just, you know, 10 years later, I was 30 years old and felt like I didn't have a whole lot of life experience by right. way of uh, uh, the, the average life experience in America. So what I did was I said, in order to continue creating movies, I have to believe in those the movies that I'm making and that they have sure. a message for sure. the general population, not just my sugar cookies, you know? <laughs> right. So what I did was I kind of turned my back on everything that I knew or had been, been taught and really made a concerted effort to go the other way. And part of that was, you know, drugs and alcohol, um, just because that's, it's a normal thing for most people to do. Um, or at least experiment when they're younger. The problem was is that if you get handed the key to the liquor cabinet when you're 30, you still have to learn those things. Right. And it takes years to, you know, if if teenagers are starting that when they're 12 or th 14, then then they have four to six years before they're, you know, legally able to, get that key to the liquor cabinet okay. you know what i'm saying right sure and so i feel like for me it was a normal process to go down that rabbit hole but um i did it a little bit um balls to the wall yeah can i say that on this oh you can, you can um, swear you can do whatever you want okay, okay. um <laughs> so i went pedal to the metal with with pretty much everything by way of um thinking new thoughts allowing myself to um, ingest what I wanted and see what happened. And, uh, five years later I was a full blown alcoholic. I had moved back to Utah and I was, uh, air quotes working here, but really for me, writing or, or working, um, had become escapism okay. where I would stay home and right. imbibe. Okay. 
Well, back let's jump back just a little bit. So you 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 were making films and this and that. Did you have this feeling as you were doing this that some you didn't feel authentic in it? I mean, because you you mentioned when you you felt like you hadn't really lived life yet and you weren't wouldn't be very good making films had you not. What right. what led up to that moment? I mean, did you notice beforehand, years even before, that something felt off for you? I or? had. There's. Um, I don't know how many of your listeners are non-Mormon or Mormon or LDS. I, I, most are not. Most are not yeah. LDS. Okay. Well, there there was a subgenre of film that started in uh, the 2000s that was a lot of LDS people were making movies for the LDS population. And um, I really didn't want to get into doing that. But in order to make movies for the general population, I was copying copies. I was really copying what I saw and liked right? because I didn't understand why I liked it. And I was kind of copying the copies of the copies. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. It wasn't, for me, it wasn't authentic. I was trying to be authentic. I was being honest, but I just didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And so obviously that was bothering you to a point where I could see it pre pretty clearly. Yeah. So yeah. talk about leading up to that moment where, and it maybe it wasn't a moment. Maybe it was a, it was a, a, a process to where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna, I am gonna drink, I am gonna try to start doing some drugs, I am gonna, you know, start doing these things that I have withheld from my entire life. Talk about what led up to that, if you can remember sure. that process. I, I got into movies in order to teach through story. Okay. I thought that would be the best way to, <clears throat> to, to have it's a it's a very privileged opportunity when you have someone sitting in a room for two hours with a, being being willing to drop their inhibitions and allow you to tell them a story and just absorb the story without any um, negative uh, any barriers right right and I, it's a great opportunity for teaching sure. That's why I went into it at first. I very quickly, well, not quickly, it was a process. I was in there for about 10 years. And at the point where I left and turned around, I did not like myself very much. I had become a real jerk, very egotistical, very selfish. Okay. Uh, it's it's kind of like if if you're selling toothpaste, you talk about the toothpaste forever, and you're right. thinking about toothpaste all the time, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. this is the best toothpaste, right. and you just want to talk it to, about it to everybody, sure. right? When you're an actor or in Hollywood, it's very difficult not to be selling yourself. You have to sell yourself. Mm. And if you're talking about yourself all the time, it becomes very dif difficult to s stay in reality and and not think about yourself. Yeah, At I've time. heard I've yeah. heard that before. Where I've had other uh, spoken to other actors or actresses who have said exact same thing you're saying right now. Yeah. yeah, so I experienced a lot of that. Okay, and when I came up for air, I didn't like myself, and I I was just like, okay, I got to do something different. And if I was going to teach through story, I really wanted to have something to teach. I didn't I didn't feel like I was able to teach anything because didn't have a whole lot of, you know, if story is all about conflict and conflict resolution, right. where was my conflict? And, and so I went looking for a fight, I think. And, <laughs> <Right>. and uh, <laughs> a buddy of mine, uh, like years and years before that, had said, it takes years to become an, al an alcoholic. At the same, you know, in the same vein, my grandfather died of alcoholism. Okay. And I have... Um, addiction that runs in my family. Um, some some of my c cousins have really struggled with it and have, thank goodness, overcome it and are doing really well. Right. But I think it was a question in my mind that I wanted to answer. Okay. That what I didn't realize was you actually have to overcome the addiction, not just get addicted. And that was difficult for me. At the point where I got a DUI, crashed my brother's car into a tree in a mall parking lot. At that point, I was like, 
the the thought went through my mind. I, I heard the the words very clearly. You don't have to do this anymore. And mm. at that point, I was like, okay, this is great. I mean, I was being arrested, but I felt a lot of peace at that moment. Of almost it. as almost like man, this this particular incident incidents is going to make me kind of woke you up like what am i doing i don't have to keep doing this right why why am i doing this kind of thing right okay yeah um so that that started that started me back but i didn't realize how long it would take and what a struggle it would be mm -hmm. to actually get the physical and the mental addiction taken care of and right. i I don't like to call it addiction anymore, right? Um, just because I think there's a, a a bigger problem there. I mean, if if you took the drugs away from me, it didn't make me a nice guy, right? I mean, there was still I was still a jerk, yeah. And most people are the same way. There was a lot of brain damage involved. You know, if you if you smoke, you're gonna have broken lungs. Mm -hmm. If you drink heavily, you're gonna have a broken brain. And uh, a lot of the book deals with um, building your brain back and fixing the f the structure in order to fix the function. And I found a lot of my personal personality defects that I had grown throughout my addiction were just took care of themselves once I had built my brain back. Gotcha. So um, when this when you when you crashed your was it your brother's car. Yeah, it was my brother's car. So when you crashed the car, you got arrested, got the DUI. Um, did you serve time in jail at all for that, or was it just more of... I did. I, I got to spend two nights in jail, which was even more of a life changer than <laughs> yeah. the the actual arresting and booking and things like that. Um, I realized very quickly in jail that that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And that is that is what I term as the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is is that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. This the only solution to that problem, regardless of why you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, porn, work, working out, whatever the the cause of that, the only solution, gratefully it makes it very simple is to start doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And that's really what the book about is about, um, is how to know what you're supposed to be doing and go do it. And it, it's, uh, it's pretty simple, but not always easy. Yeah. But if I cling to that when I'm having problems and if I cling to that, it's, it just makes it very simple. Right. And I can just get to work. Yeah. And and make sure that if I need to be if I'm mm -hmm. if I'm supposed to be watching a movie with my friends, I'm watching a movie with my friends. Yeah, gotcha. And if I'm supposed to be at work, head down, I'm there. That's what I'm doing. Head down. So. Well, I love that. I love the simplicity because I agree. I couldn't agree more that I think we as human beings try to overcomplicate everything. And most of my clients that I deal with, who've been doing you know s dealing with addictions for decades the problem's so big in their head that they think the solution's got to be gigantic. But in reality, like you're saying, is it's actually pretty simple. Yeah. And the biggest pushback I get is, it can't be that simple. you know. But the truth is, no, it really is that simple. We just want to overcomplicate it. Yeah. So I love that you said what you said is, you know, if I could just go, you know what, just get to work, put my head down, do those things, simplify it, I'm, I'm good kind of thing. Right. So after you're, so you go to jail for a couple of nights. Was this kind of the road back for you at that moment? Did you, were you like going, okay, I, I'm I'm not going to do this anymore? Is that, or did you have other things going on? Did you continue drinking after that? Did you continue doing drugs? I after that incident. I I think I think what you're talking about is relapse, and most definitely did I relapse. Um, I I think we. Hmm. Will you ask that question again in a different way? Um, so, I mean, you said you had this, you know, it was a really amazing moment for you in this going to jail for a couple of nights. Like it was a more of a wake up call for you than anything else. What I'm saying was that when you from that point forward decided, you know what, I'm done. 
I'm going to go fix yeah. my life. I'm going to go make things great again. You know, I'm going to go live the what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes. Yes. But then I forgot. Right. And I think people forget that very easily. Mm-hmm. I think there's something in the scriptures, the Bible that says man is quick to forget or something like that. I, I, I'm not sure, but we certainly are. Um, we forget the things that hurt us. Right. People go back to past loves that they know aren't good for themselves. And for me, the substances had become my best friend and my past love. And when I finally got some, you know, had some time where I had felt like I was better, immediately it came back. And what's it? The the thoughts of uh, thoughts of I could do such and such and be just fine. Um, and it was, it was, it for, for me, I think it, it was a lot of kind of proving to myself that I had, had overcome it. If I could do it in moderation, then I had overcome it, but it quickly became something else. I mean, I, I didn't understand relapse and I didn't understand the regret and the, the recovery that comes after it. We put, I think we, in my first experience was AA with addiction recovery. Mm-hmm. And there's this cycle of recovery, relapse, regret, recovery, relapse, regret that was very disenchanting to me. And I didn't realize that cycle until a, a long time later. But if you can stop worrying about the relapse or if you can stop what I did when I finally turned a corner and actually felt like I was actually getting better. Right. And that was very recent. It was, it was years ago. It was maybe mm-hmm. two years ago when I mm-hmm. finally said, okay, I have to quit doing all this nonsense right. and what everyone else tells me and just do it by myself and figure this out. Um, because I was taking the MCAT and you can't take the MCAT while you're distracted by, Drugs and alcohol, you sure. sh- it's just impossible. <laughs> they make it impossible. You have to have a clear mind. You have to have focus. And so what I did was I, I broke it down. And this is, I think I'm going off the question that you asked. But, That's right. You're good. Keep but going. what I did was I, I broke it down to the, the, the simplest, the core problem. And like I said, um, that problem, I couldn't find that problem until I defined addiction in the way that I that I define it now, and which is a, a chronic distraction from from what I'm supposed to be doing. And when I def- started defining it as that, the problem is in implemented in that that definition. So what was the problem then? With that definition, what was your problem? The problem was I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. If I was thinking about drugs and alcohol while I while during the lecture, then. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. If I wasn't hanging out with friends and getting uh, uh, that release, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. If I wasn't sleeping enough, I wasn't doing what I, if I wasn't eating good, well, Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And the only solution is to start doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so it made it really simple. And when I defined it as, as such, I found the problem and and I stopped focusing on the problem. I only focused on the solution, yeah. which is to add good things to your life and do what you're supposed to. And make make, make good better, right? Exactly. <laughs> and and inherent in, in making good better is admitting that you're a good person. Right. And and for me, a lot of that came down to living my life focused on what is and what will be instead of what is right and wrong Mm. and making what is and what will be better instead of trying to figure out what is right and wrong. Right. Because everybody has a different definition of that. Sure. Every society, every time and place, 10 years from now, there's going to be a different right and wrong, but there is what you should be doing and there is what is and what will be. I like, I, I liken that to someone foretelling the future if you know what is and what will be, that's the f- that's being able to know what will happen. Right. If you're going off what is right and wrong, 
There's no way. Yeah. There's no way to tell. Yeah. So you go through this process, and, and again, you were doing film, right? You know, doing feature films. You're doing all those things that go in, that are involved with that. You yeah. wanted to be more authentic. You go through this challenging time in your life with addiction and things like that. And did you did you did it help you down the road with the with the with the filmmaking and producing and directing and all that? You mean um, going turning around? Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Yeah. Describe yes. that and give us a little background on that. Um, I actually haven't made anything except for a TV sh series, a pilot for a TV series, but it's the best thing that I've made. Um, and it just came on a whim. Right, okay. Uh, I really distanced myself from media completely during, okay. those, the, during those years sure. when I turned around. And I, um, I wouldn't watch movies. I wouldn't watch TV wouldn't read the newspaper, wouldn't watch the news, like nothing. I didn't want to hear about what was going on in the world. I just wanted to de deconstruct so that I could have a really flat ground to build on when I started building again. Um, so did I get better? I, th I think I got better at the storytelling aspect of it. I definitely have something to say now. Sure. Um, and I do have opinions that are, are my own. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, um, so now, you know, you've kind of, so talk about, so you decided to write this book, talk about a little more detail. You've obviously mentioned it and a few things about it. Get a little more detail of what, what would someone find in this book if they got this book from you? Right. Um, I guess what I would say is that if I had a child, this is what I would give him or her and, to read. And, and why? Because it's real, it's pretty honest. It has, it, it tells the, it the, t most addictions are the same story from a different chair. What what you can find in this book is, is an honest depiction, and an honest way of getting getting through it and okay. over it, and mm -hmm. not just not just getting over something. It's it really is a way that I try to live my life in order to be more effective in working with other people. Um, I grew up very competitive. I played sports a lot. Mm -hmm. And when I entered film, I was a competitive being right. working with collaborative people. <laughs> and I had to really consciously work on that stuff and work on working with others and work on being open to learning from other people. Like coming to talk to you um, driving here, I was, I was like, okay, go learn as much as you can. And when we sat down and, and butted heads for just a second, I was like, oh man, I'm not learning right now. I got to yeah. start learning, yeah. you know, like that it's a, it's a shift in mindset where instead of looking at problems, you're looking for solutions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I like that. And I appreciate that because we do have to be open, you know, and, and I think, just talking about it like the way we were and, and yes we maybe butted heads just a little bit and it's kind of funny actually it's a good thing sure. but you know sure. we're, we've realized we're, we're we're on the same lines we have the same philosophies the same kind of uh, approach on overcoming addiction because I'm the, I'm with you we're you know I don't believe in labeling I think labels are cages um, but but there's also some labels that can set us free you know labeling who I, who I am really versus yeah. who the or at least the story I used to tell myself kind of thing and and so but I do appreciate the approach that you take how you just simplified it down to the I've just got to do what I know what what's the right thing what should I be doing right now I yeah. shouldn't be thinking about this I should be focused on what's in front of me you know whether that's yeah. school or friends or my work that kind of thing and so yeah. again I, I do I love the simplicity of that and and I do love how you're not a fan of any of these labels and, and, and you're speaking my, you're preaching to the choir here with me. I'm right there with you because I think as we, when we do label ourselves, we do pin ourselves into a corner and it's like, this is just who I am. You know, I'm an addict. I'll be that for the rest of my life. You know, that's why I always will say something, you know, in effect, because I'm in this industry. So 
I'm always talking about I'm recovered versus I'm in recovery. You can be recovered, meaning it's done, it's over, let's move on, go live your life. But I'll never forget, and I'm grateful that I went through all of it, you know. So, anyway, but I, but I again, I do love your approach. <laughs> Thank you. I I do too. It it's the only work thing that worked for me, and so I f- I'm pretty passionate about sa- sharing it with other people, and I've gotten really good responses for the book, um, and so it kind of that I mean people calling and saying I need a couple copies more right. to send to my people. I mean, that's the best, the best feedback I can possibly get. Right. Um, but yeah, it's about it. For me, it's about adding positive and not focusing on removing a negative. Mm-hmm. If you're focused on removing a negative, then you're still adding negative negativity to your life. Right. And I, I, in the book, I talk about there's two ways to affect your life in a positive way. And one is to remove a negative, but the other is to add a positive right and if you add positives just focusing on positives naturally the negatives fall to the side because there really is only so much bandwidth that we can handle right in our brains there's only so much food you can put in your mouth in a day yeah. and if you add good food then you're cutting down on the bad food right naturally yeah. that works with with the people that you surround yourself with You know, people say, ask me, look, should I find a new crew? Should I, you know, take out, you know, stop hanging out with these people? And it's the same thing, you know, add good, positive people in your, to your life. And you probably won't have much time for the the negativity. Right. No, that's, that's a great point. I I couldn't agree more. I think, I think uh, there's a, there's a, some data out there that says that people we talk to ourselves anywhere from 60,000 to 70,000 words each day and roughly around 79 80% is negative. And so I mean that's a big that's a big lopsided uh for the negative, right? Yeah, that's and me. so totally me. <laughs> yeah, and so flipping that like you're saying, well, yeah, we got to we got to address the negative. Why am I being here? But I'm going to add all these positives at the same time. And so let's tip the scales. Let's even them out a little bit, you know. So yeah. I like that. We, we work so hard on putting our best foot forward to other people, but we don't, we really don't do that to ourselves. Yeah. And we deserve it. We, <laughs> we, it that's, and that's the truth. The truth is, is that you're a great person. Right. And you have amazing talents and you can affect people for good. Yeah. And that's not what we tell ourselves usually. Yeah, we get we get really down on ourselves for for nothing and for actually being human and and learning and growing. Yeah, I like that a lot. So, you what are what are your future plans? I mean, I know you wrote this book, and we you mentioned before with me um, that you, you know you want to be in a position to be helping people in this kind of capacity. And so, talk about that a little bit and kind of what your you know your goals are with this. That's a really good question because I'm not so sure in my own mind where I'm at right now. Okay. I definitely want to help people. That's why I started into prerequisites for uh, med school. And that's why I got in, you know, I'm going to med school right now in my mind. I'm going to med school. But at the same time, if I can help more people through this capacity, Uh um, my mind is open. Yeah. There is, there is so much information out there that I could get through med school that is also on the internet. Right. And to have a degree in medicine is hugely beneficial in order to treat patients the way that you want to treat them. For sure, yeah. But it's not completely necessary in all aspects of, of, right. of medicine. Right. By way of much of what, you do is unregulated right now, Mm -hmm. which brings the point of how much of what you can find out there in recovery is a good method, you know, how much of it is worthwhile. Um, So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm tiptoeing into this side of things, Yeah, but it's, it's definitely a question mark in my mind. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I think it's great that uh, you're even thinking of that and, and and then the med school piece. I mean that that's quite an undertaking, first of all. So 
Sure. Congrats on making that decision. Thanks. That's it's uh, and you start that like you said in about three weeks. You said thank you. Three weeks, yeah. <laughs> um, three weeks almost to the day, and like you said, it's a huge undertaking. It's eight years of my life. It's going to be eight years, yeah. Which is a fun eight years, but at the same time, that's that's a tenth of my life. And well, uh, it's a good thing you are only so twenty one. So that's great. <laughs> you you look twenty one, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously, you I really do. <laughs> that's yeah. that's very nice of you. It's, that's just the truth, right? It's, yeah, you look very young. It's years of of relaxing without children. Yeah, well, and that and, and not not having an addiction until you were thirty. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> that, true. That didn't that that helped as well, I think. But uh, probably. Well, if if uh, if you could give any advice to someone who might be hearing this uh, podcast and listening to it, who may be struggling or or has a family member struggling with addiction or, you know, they're not quite sure what to do or they're maybe they don't like the, the AA model approach, the disease model or whatever. What, what advice could you give them? You know, what would be some, 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 uh, direction you could give them? I would, I, I, I would say stop looking at recovery as a drag through the dirt, horrible experience. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing I ever did was be an addict. It was 24 hours a day. It took all my money, my friends, my family, my career, took yeah. everything and gave yeah. absolutely nothing back. It damaged my brain. It hurt my body. Yeah. If you start recovering, you will get better. And it's a beautiful process and it will increase your quality of life from the second you do it. Yeah. Um, I love that. But if it comes, as long as it comes from a positive place, you know, like you got to be doing it with the right intention and the right yeah. focus. You got to be doing it for yourself first. You can't be doing it for any other people. But I would say that that stigma that that recovery has of being a horrible experience should probably change yeah. because it's not. Yeah, That's not the truth of what's going on. The truth is, is that the worst experience you'll ever have is being an addict and anything, anything after torture is great. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Very well said. I would add to that, that, you know, like I'll tell my clients, you've hit the jackpot. I mean, totally. yeah, you, you're yeah. at the best university on the planet. You know, I, that's, and I'm, we're, we're a lot the same there. I, I look at recovery, especially where I hear at Wasatch recovery is I call it the, the, honestly, the best university on the planet. It's not about drugs and alcohol. That's it's not even about that. It's about what is the core issue? Where where is it? Where are you really coming from? Let's get to that point, you know, kind of like what you did when you figured out, you know. Yeah. yeah, I can take away the drugs and alcohol. I was still being a mean, you know, asshole sometimes, right? Yeah, exactly. But, but finding that out and figuring those things out, you know. So Yeah, can I But can very I, well said, please. Can I add one more thing? Add, please. Because I think relapse is something that we misdefine and and it gets a stigma as well um when i was doing it the other way i'll call it the other way before i found what worked for me i had a lot of fear and guilt associated with relapse i was scared of it before it happened and i was felt super guilty afterward for to the tune of weeks wow. and it would set me back to the very beginning yeah it was like the one of those um video games from the 80s where where every time you die you go back to the beginning of the whole game and you're just like what no and it made me not want to play the game anymore you don't have to start over that's what i'd say to people you can start where you left off mm -hmm. and that was one of the main points of how i what worked for me sure. was i stopped standing up in front of other people and saying i'd, I'd never do it again because the truth is is that statistically and from my own experience I did do it again. Mm -hmm. And there's always that chance. Like someone said to me today, he said, well, I'm clean for now. I'm, I'm, it, I've been clean for a long time. Let's see if I've got 40 more years in me. You know, mm -hmm. the, the idea that you're not going to do something again that you already did, that you said you wouldn't, is, is kind of a lie to yourself and other people. And there's really no reason to, to have that self-declaration or that public declaration um, when for me, what worked for me was to say, 
I will probably relapse in my lifetime. Let's get ready for it. And what, when it happens or if it happens, let's get up as fast as you can. Yeah. And let's get on with your life. Not where you were before, but where you are right now and learn from it. And that made such a world of difference for me, Todd, that, that I can't even describe how fast it worked. And I relapsed from the point where I made the decision to make, do this method. I did right. relapse. Sure. But that is beside the point. I learned from each time. Yeah. And I got better and better. And mountains don't go like this. They go like this. Yeah, they're, they're not smooth listeners, that's what they're, you're saying. They're not a straight shot yeah. up. They, are, they have switchbacks. And they have ups and downs, but they, it's, it's, for me, it's about sustainable progression and not that idea that I'm just going to make one decision and my life's going to change forever. Right. It's a learning process. And so I would say that treat relapse the way it actually is. And most everybody who's an addict has relapsed or else they wouldn't be classified in that regard. Um, and everyone has the, the, there's the chance that everyone who has done it will do it again. And so let's be realistic about it and say, look, if it happens, let's be ready, yeah. which means good routines, good habits, eating healthy, um, sleeping enough, getting good friends, people who you're not scared about talking about it with. Right. Um, a, a sponsor never kept me from relapsing. Yeah. Well, that's, ever. yeah. Sponsors don't keep you clean. No, they don't. It comes from within yourself. But they, they can help, though. Yeah, they, they can. They can support and Most help. definitely. When I started looking at relapse as a step back instead of using or misusing drugs and alcohol, but as a step back in my personal progression, then when I stopped, when I, when I have a lull in my workout regi regime or I start eating crappy, for time, I consider that a relapse in my personal prog progression. It's not about drugs and alcohol. But why would you do it's that and make that a negative? Why would that be a relapse? Because when I when I'm when I stop progressing, for me that's a relapse. Now, it has nothing yeah. to do with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. It has has to do with me personally, um, not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. And and it's not I. I don't I don't feel like it's a negative for me. I just feel like okay, I realize now that I'm not doing what I'm supposed what to. You should be Let's doing. get going. Gotcha. It's a it's a momentary fix. Right. Now, it's not a I don't feel bad about it. Sure. I'm just like, oh, okay. I need to eat yeah. start eating healthy gotcha. again. Gotcha. Makes sense. Like that. Very so. well said. Thank you for sharing that. Um if someone wants to reach out to you and they want to maybe get a copy of your book or they want to just reach out to you and ask you a question, what would be the best way for them to do that? The best way is www.makinggoodbetter.net. Okay. Um, the website is in constant change. Change, but, right? <laughs> but you can find the book. You can find the audio book and the ebook well, on right there. On. Perfect. I like audio books personally because sure. I'm a audi auditory yeah, a lot of learner. people love those yeah. nowadays, and yeah. yeah, people like to listen to them when they're driving or working out and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So, so that would be the best way for them to go to that website and and, yeah. and they can order the book and they could also reach out to you and ask you a question. Yes. If they have a question about yeah. this. There okay. is. Great. And thank you so much for having no, me. No, thank this you. Been amazing. No, thank you. And I, again, I do love your approach and I do, uh, I'm grateful that uh, Lindy, like I said, got us hooked up to, it was like a last second thing and I'm so grateful that it worked out for both of us. And, uh, so I can't thank you enough for spending some time and, and sharing your story with us. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Well, there you go, listeners. Thank you for your time and, again, for your support. Uh, if you have someone that you know that might be struggling, would uh, love to know more about uh, you know, Ben's approach, please check out his website, grab his book, and uh, read it, share it with someone, and uh, let's get the word out. And, uh, you know, again, I, th I, I think there's many paths to uh, – being recovered 
and 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 I love like I said I love Ben's approach and I, I I can't thank you enough for being vulnerable and being willing to share your portion of what you've been through in your life. Thanks, okay, thanks, listeners. There you go. Have an amazing day. Till next time.